Thank you. Um, so, as a disclaimer right from the start, I will not talk about layering. Uh, um, I'll introduce a method that may be useful for those who are thinking about anti-diffusive phenomena in terms of turbulent diffusion, in the sense that um, I'll discuss a method on how to decompose uh, fluxes of ideal invariance or um, uh, in terms of field gradients, which we can then um, compute, so quantify, but also physically interpret. And this is joint work with Damiano Capocci, um, who is a PhD student with Luca Pifarala at the University of Torbergato, who's been visiting me um, for extended periods of time. And then uh, Sean Orton involved um, from Baikato, New Zealand, and Perry Johnson from uh, UC Irvine at the moment. Okay. Um, so what are we setting out to do? We'd like to understand the physical processes that govern the cascades of, for instance, in their, um, or interscale transfer processes of, and here I'm specific to hydrodynamics and MHD, so you have the, the um, quantities are invariant in the limit of having zero dissipation. Uh, for, for the Euler equation, for instance, you have the kinetic helicity, which is conserved, and then for ideal MHD, um, there's, kinetic, there's uh, the total energy, and then there's a cross helicity and the, kinetic, uh, the magnetic helicity, which is quantifies correlation between the different fields. <clears throat> um, the method that I'll discuss uh, is an approach to construct physically interpretable, physically interpretable observables for the energy fluxes. Um, we'll, what I'll do is um, I'll use an a priori LES filtering approach that so we uh, work with SGS uh, stress tensors. And then the point really is um, there's a method by which you can uh, express the SGS, so the subgrid scale stresses through velocity and magnetic field gradients, and then you decompose velocity and magnetic field gradients into uh, the, the uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric parts, so either magnetic strain and current or um, strain and vorticity, and then these are, these are coupled up. And you can think of, uh, for instance, uh, effect like vortex stretching and strain cell amplification. So what I'll do first, I'll introduce a method by looking at hydrodynamics, and then I'll come to MHD and, um, and see how far I, I get. <clears throat> so what we do, we, uh, and there's a reason why I use index notation here. Um, I'll come to that later. So we, we consider the incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. Um, uh, with the usual advective term, the pressure gradient dissipation, so that the, the derivatives here are noted in that way. We should probably change the notation and then external forcing. And um, I separate, as usual in ADS or in, in any form of uh, subject scale modeling, we separate the large from the small scales by a filtering operation. And what here is just depicted that I've taken from, from Perry's JFM is just a, a visualization of homogeneous anisotropic turbulence in the mid plane. And uh, what you see are velocity fluctuations um, scaled by the RMS velocity. And essentially, the filtering is just um, as you do if I would take off my glasses. Um, so I would only see your faces as some sort of blobs. <laughs> OK, this is a little bit pedestrian. So those familiar with subfit scale modeling um, might find that quite boring. Um, so what we do, we take a filter. And I'm not going to specify the filter right now. It will become very important later on. Um, what the filter is. So, <clears throat> um, an overbar L denotes a filter velocity field. I filter each term in the equation. And as you can see here, in terms of LES, this is not a closed equation in terms of the filtered field. So, what we do in terms of having a, a closed equation, we <clears throat> uh, define the subgrid scale stresses by being the difference between the product of two filtered fields and the product of the filtered product of two fields. <clears throat> um, and we do, we add and subtract um, this term, and we have a closed system on the left hand side. And then, usually in subgrid scale modeling, you need to supply a model for the subgrid scale stresses. And um, one of the upshots of what, we'll, what I'll discuss is to give some guidance on how this may be done in MHD. Um, now, if we write down a, um, an equation for the energy content just in the filtered field, so in the large scale field, um, we have a term that I'll ignore and what follows. This would be, a, in, for instance, in the homogeneous and isotropic turbulence, this is a, this is a result scale advection, so that would um, 
uh, vanishing mean, so we're not, I, I'm not going to be bothered with this term, and then there's the energy input from the forcing. Then we have the, the energy flux across the scales, which is the strain rate tensor contracted with the subgrid scale stresses. And this is what we'll be discussing, and then our viscous dissipation, which again I will not consider um, going further. Um, now I come to the important point about the filter. So I define the velocity field uh, at the convolution with the filter kernel. And um, if we choose this filter kernel to be Gaussian, then what can be done is we can formally write um, just an equation for um, the filter velocity where we take the filter scale as a time-like variable. And <clears throat> subject to this sort of you, an, uh, an initial condition in inverted commas, um, which is at time equal zero or filter scale, the smallest filter scale possible, so no filtering at all, which is the original field. So we have, an, we have a diffusion equation in terms of the filter scale in principle, which is a consequence just of having a Gaussian. And if I do that, I can, <coughs> I can do the, the same thing for the, for the subgrid scale stresses, except that now I have a forcing in my equation. And then I can formally solve this for the, um, with an initial condition that I have no subgrid scale stresses, because if I take the filter scale to zero, then the subgrid scale stress vanishes. And the formal solution of this force equation, force diffusion equation, <coughs> is um, an expression for the subgrid scale stresses in terms of field gradients. Uh, so I just take you through this equation here. Um, I should have included a, a, a secondary step. Um, so we have to remember that the, let just go one back, we have to remember that the fluxes are given by the contraction of the strain rate with the subgrid scale stress. So if I express the subgrid scale stress as a resolved scale contribution and um, a multi-scale contribution, um, and then in order to get the flux, I have to contract it with a symmetric part of the velocity uh, mm. gradient tensor, so the strain rate. And really the, the, the solution to this equation would just be this term here, where I integrate from zero to L squared of all possible filter scales, and I have to double filter. The term that I'm having, that I have subtracted here, is um, you can just solve the integral, and it trivially gives this term in front. So this is just to separate out what is a multi-scale component and what is a single-scale component of this quantity. And then what I can do is I can substitute into the respective field gradients <coughs> the current, um, sorry, the, um, uh, the vorticity and the strain, and I get the product of, um, of either strain rate tensors or strain and, and vorticity. Um, there has to be said something about this as well. Um, these are all quantities that you can compute from data. So if I take my numerical simulation, um, it is not going to be cheap, but we can calculate the field gradients and we can integrate over the filter scales. Um, okay. So if we do that in formal notation, so that I don't have to deal with all the indices, I can write my, rewrite my formula as a trace of the velocity um, uh, gradient tensor transposed, um, the velocity gradient tensor, and again, the velocity gradient tensor transpose. There's a reason I'm writing it like this that will become clear later. We have to generalize this method for MHD um, because in the induction equation, I have to deal with separate scale ten tensors that are not symmetric, so I cannot just take uh, the strain rate um, in, the, in the front here. Um, so if we keep this structure in mind, then what I can do is I substitute in the strain rate as a symmetric part of the velocity field gradient and the vorticity uh, tensor, if you like, as the anti-symmetric part, and do the algebra, then I get five contributions. It's either a coupling of strain rates or a vortex stretching term, and they have um, <coughs> single scale or local components and non-local components. And this is, these are terms that we're familiar with. And, excuse me, the vortex stretching for <coughs> as the main contributor to the, to the energy cascade. 
and then there's a better relation that relates vortex stretching to to strain self amplification. <clears throat> there's a, third, a fifth term that that comes out, which is um, a correlation between subfilter um, subfilter strain rate and vorticity coupled to the resolved scale strain rate. And this is a term. This is the only term that survives in two D. So if you do this for 2D, everything else vanishes, and this term is the only one that survives. Um, now, just to give you an idea of what these different terms do physically, vortex stretching we understand. Um, so I've left this out because I think everybody is, is, is familiar with that. If you have strain self-amplification, you can think of um, a strain rate tensor with one strong compressive direction, because, it will, because we're incompressible, We'll have two, either two extensional direction, one compressive direction, or two extensional, two compressive direction, one extensional direction. If I take a strain rate tensor with one strong compressive direction, and I have a flow, then <clears throat> what happens is that fl slow moving fluid in front um, and fast moving fluid in the back, so the, the fast moving fluid in the back will catch up with the strong moving fluid in the front, and what you have is a compression effect that is sort of pictorial um, shown here where um, the, this represents sort of the, the scale at which the strain is acting. And so you have, to that effect, an increase uh, in the strain rate at smaller scales. This is what, what we call strain self-amplification. <clears throat> and it turns out that this is a significant uh, contributor to the energy cascade, the forward energy cascade. And then there is this term, which is... Um, Which is, a, which is the only term that I, said, I say again that survives in 2D. Um, and you see here a strain rate tensor interacting with a strain and, a, and, and, and a vorticity. And the way that, um, that this is interpreted is if you have um, a vortex interacting with large scale strain, then that vortex will be, will be stretched out into a thinner and thinner sheet. So you're stretching this vortex out into uh, essentially a region of shear and the resulting strain rate to have, for instance, an inverse cascade has to align in this, with a, the, the, the eigenvalues of the strain rate have to be at 45, de 45 degrees <clears throat> with the strain rate eigenvalues of the resolved scale strain rate. So this would be the case if you have an inverse cascade and if they align in the other direction with respect to the rotation, then you have a forward cascade. So this term can carry both in principle. Um, well, it turns out that this in, in, um, in 2D would, would carry the inverse cascade. It's the only term that, that, that can do that. Everything else vanishes. And you see as well, um, if you would have this as, as a resolved scale quantity, so just the strain, strain, and vorticity at the same scale, at the same filter scale, um, then by the cyclic property of the trace, you can prove that this vanishes. So this is intrinsically a multi-scale, multi um, uh, a multi-scale, Term. Okay. Now, if you remember the structure that I've written down that you had, uh, you, can get, you can write the flux as um, the product of three gradients of the velocity, then what you can do is you can generalize this to any couple of advection diffusion equation involving vector fields, um, or better said, uh, uh, an evolution equation of conserved quantities in, in the ideal limit. Um, by saying I take two, three generic vector fields and I, I can write down this expression generalized. And so this allows an application to MHD, so either energy <coughs> cascades, but also for, for instance, the, the kinetic helicity can, get, can be decomposed in this way. So in order to do that, you would define A as a vorticity field, so you have a gradient of vorticity, and then you have a loss velocity field and another velocity, they would have gradient of vorticity, gradient of velocity, gradient of velocity. And then you would go in decomposing into strain and um, so into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts of the respective field gradient tensors, and you would get a decomposition of the kinetic helicity flux. And I don't think I'll have time to talk about this, but we have done it um, and, and got, a, got some interesting results and, and also um, we numerically discovered there was a batch of relation for the helicity flux, um, which then we were able to prove um, in the same publication. Okay, so here I'll focus on MHD, and in MHD we have different terms. In the 
um, momentum and adduction equation. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, essentially, if you, would, you have the Maxwell fluxes, which uh, come from the Lorentz force, and to construct them, we would be taking the two fields in the back as a magnetic field, and, and then um, we have a velocity field, ten, gradient tensor in front. Um, we can go to the, to the induction equation and define something that I have to say in invert to come as a dynamo flux. And this is not necessary to do with field line stretching. It's, I say dynamo flux because it, it originates from, from the term B gradient U. Um, and we can do the same for the advection of magnetic field lines by the flow. Now the latter two have the same physical origin. They come from the electric field. Um, so they, they should really be discussed um, together. Okay. So just to give a little bit of an overview <clears throat> of which terms we have and what the MHD equations do. Um, so if I have a total energy flux in MHD, then it has four contributions that come from the different terms in the MHD equation. So either what we call an inertial flux, which comes from the usual U grab U. Um, then we can, we can define a Maxwell flux that comes from the Maxwell stresses or from the Lorentz force. So here I've just kept the, um, the magnetic tension term and the magnetic pressure is absorbed in the, in the pressure. And then we have the induction equation where we have, field, where we have advection of magnetic field lines and, and what we normally say is field line stretching. And, um, and we can define, as I said, we can define fluxes. Now you would say, well, where is, uh, I don't only have fluxes in this equation, I also have a coupling between magnetic and kinetic energy. So um, my flow, my magnetic field is, is um, in the case that we're looking at, um, maintained by the velocity, so a saturated dynamo, if you like. And so there's one term that's left over here, which um, is a entirely a large scale term. And this is what causes magnetic field line stretching. This is a, this is a term that, that maintains the magnetic field fluctuation in this flow. And this is, we are not concerned with this term. So here I'm only looking at interscale transfer. So this term uh, is, not, is not included. <clears throat> it's important for subgrid scale modeling though to resolve, to resolve this term because otherwise the, the, the growth rates are not, are not correctly uh, recovered. Okay. So now I can define um, stress tensors for each of these terms. So I have an inertial term, which is just the usual one that, that we know from, from hydrodynamics. Then I have a Maxwell stress, which is an analogy to this. And then here I have the two contributions on the induction equation. So you'll notice that they are transposes of each other. And, um, and in the last 10 minutes that I have, 12 minutes, I'll talk you to some of the results that we have obtained. I probably can only discuss th these two, but I'm happy to, to talk about the rest another time um, or when I'm back um, in, in a few weeks. <clears throat> okay, uh, I think I can skip this because this is just the flux definitions. The only thing to notice is because tau ij for the dynamo and the advective flux is not symmetric, we cannot just um, define the flux as uh, as using the, uh, the the strain rate tensor, we have to have um, the full velocity gradient. So there will be contributions that 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 come from the current here as well. Okay. Um, before I, I come to the to the results uh, from the decomposition, we used five data sets um, in, for MHD and hydrodynamics. So in hydrodynamics, we just have. Um, one and the, the four others are, are several MHD con, uh, configurations, either with um, either sort of a high resolution for zero mean magnetic field, and then we have a lower resolution where we vary the <coughs> magnetic field strength, and um, and we compare with a high resolution uh, hydrodynamic simulation. These are all this is all hyperviscous data. We've also compared the viscous, and results are very similar. But here I only show the hyperviscous. So to concentrate on the inertia flux, I'll make a comparison between MHD and, uh, and hydrodynamics. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time on this slide because there's lots of curves. So we decompose the inertia flux into the five contributions that I've had on one of my earlier slides, where you have strain sample strain self amplification, uh, single scale and multi scale. Then we have vortex stretching, single scale and multi scale, and then we have this correlation between subscale vorticity 
the subscale strain with the large scale strain, which is the 2D, the term that survives in 2D. And here on the left, we have Navier Stokes, and on the right, we have uh, MHD without a mean magnetic field. And what you immediately notice is that the mean energy, the mean kinetic energy flux that comes from U grad U and MHD is depleted. It just goes right down. And it's not because of the flux cancellation, it's like all terms are small, except the one that is carrying, uh, in this case, actually an inverse transfer. So this would be, if you would model, you would need to model that as an anti-diffusive contribution here. Um, and we see also the, we see the batch of relations, for instance, here, the, the red curve, which is, um, which is the vortex stretching. You take that times three, you obtain the, this strain self amplification. That's a kinematic relation. Okay. <clears throat> so we keep, keep this in mind. And um, this was for no background magnetic field. Now, if I put a strong magnetic field, uh, if I apply a strong magnetic field, it's probably the color and the lights, etc., not very visible, but um, you have elongated structures in the direction where you have the magnetic field. And so you have a strong anisotropy. Um, and this is a more realistic configuration. Than, than the one without the, the, magnetic, the mean magnetic field. And if I do the same decomposition, here I have on the left the, the case where I don't have a mean magnetic field and you have a strong mean magnetic field. And what you see is, um, is that you have a much stronger contribution from the, from the inverse transfer. This is not so surprising because if you apply a strong magnetic field, you get an effective, if you, if you take it to, if, you, it's, if it's extremely strong, you, you successively two-dimensionalize the flow. It's a little bit similar to rotation. Um, so we would have expected some effect on the kinetic energy flux. What we see here is if you have the black curve, which is the total, you would only see an inverse energy flux um, at the larger scales, but actually we have it at all scales. So it's always there. So this term here that carries the, the inverse cascade as a correlation between vorticity and strain at the subscales with the large-scale strain, the the vortex shearing, if you like, or vortex flattening, um, this, this carries an, an inverse cascade here. So that would, that would tell you that if you would like to do subscale modeling, you would need to have an anti-diffusive component in your model. I'm not going to worry about stability, but, um, uh, but as a function of the magnetic field strength, this term becomes stronger. Here I'm just showing B0 equal 10. Um, we also have an intermediate case. <clears throat> And what's to be said as well is this is still an evolving, evolving system. Um, so it goes through several stages of near stationarity and it grows. So that's where we, we have, we've waited quite a long time um, in the evolution uh, to take data. Okay. Um, and to see as well what we have here is actually what we, here everything is depleted except, uh, except the, um, the inverse transfer, and here we have a little bit more of a forward transfer as well, um, which is just, I think, just due to the fact that you have, you have more energy at the large scale in this, in this um, configuration, potentially. Um, and so you have a bit of a flux constellation, which here essentially everything is, uh, is very much depleted. And all the terms that give John trouble are very small in MHD. Okay, so no vortex stretching. Um, I will have time, I think, to do the Maxwell flux and then, okay. Um, so for the Maxwell flux, uh, we have um, the following result, <clears throat> and you have very briefly discussed it, the, physical, uh, the physical interpretation. Um, in the Maxwell flux, we have one contri two contributions that carry all the energy forward in scale. Yeah. So we have, we have a few that, that are essentially negligible that come from a, from a current amplification and from a, from a restoring force against magnetic field line stretching. Um, the main contribution that we have is, uh, is the single and the multi-scale effect that comes from a strain amplification when I have a, a strain current interaction. So in structure, that's similar to the term that I discussed that in hydrodynamics only survives in 2D. So here we have a structure where we have a strain ray tensor that interacts with a current and the magnetic strain at small scales. 
So you can envision, envisage this process being um, in the induction equation, the same term shows up. So you have a you have a stretching of a current sheet. If you stretch the current sheet by magnetic stretch by by straining motion, it becomes thinner, and eventually it becomes a magnetic shear layer. And the way we interpret this term is it's not that way. That would be what the flow does to the magnetic field, but what the magnetic field does to the flow. It's a bit more complicated. So you have to think about um, the creation of extensional flow by a similar process. Okay. Um, and then we can do the same for the advection and the dynamo. And um, I don't have time to come to this, but uh, what I can say is that the term that survives is essentially this one. Uh, there's, a, there's an equivalent one in the induction equation, essentially this one that, that, that does all the, all the transfer, and it's, it's all forward and scale. Um, with that, I'll conclude. So what I discussed was an exact decomposition of flux terms here in the MHD equation. Again, it works for other directional diffusion equations involving vector fields. Um, we have a depletion of vortex stretching compared to Navier-Stokes, and not only vortex stretching, also strain self-amplification. So anything that carries the cascade forward is depleted in MHD, uh, at least in these configurations. Um, we have a two-dimensionalization in strong field MHD. That's not new. What I'm pointing out here is um, that we have an inverse kinetic energy transfer across all scales that could be isolated. And the Lorentz force provides a leading contribution to the MHD energy flux. And we have um, the physical interpretations that I just discussed. And um, then I have another slide for guidance for subgrid scale modeling. So what you would expect from these results is that you could use potentially a dissipative model for the Maxwell stress. You have to worry a little bit about um, local and non-local contribution. There's a, there's a bit of a puzzle for me in how to deal with the, with the kinetic energy flux in principle. It's almost zero, but about what I haven't shown here is there's large fluctuations. So you have a fair amount of backscatter. Now we know that backscatter um, doesn't necessarily need to be modeled, at least not in homogeneous and isotropic turbulence, because what you can show is uh, that um, because the subcritical scale stresses come through into the Navier-Stokes equations through a divergence, you, you have essentially a, a, a degree of gauge freedom. And Vela Martin discussed in 2022 that you can do an optimization procedure and you can pick subcritical scale stress in the same linear subspace that have zero backscatter. So, and, and what we've shown in a, a few years ago is that if you, if you um, pick an infinite hierarchy of statistical moments, so, in, so correlation functions and structure functions, um, that explicitly take into account the subgrid scale stresses, then, for instance, the, the statics Magorinsky model, where you don't have any backscatter, give, give you statistically the same results. So they don't um, have an impact, for instance, on anomalous exponents. <clears throat> and the challenge, really, for subscale sub -scale modeling in, in magnetic field, in my opinion, is that is the resolved scale conversion. So you have to be careful about the scale at which you filter or the scale at which you conduct your LES so that you resolve your, your magnetic field amplification is not, is not accidentally cut off because there's a specific scale to this as well. Um, and with that, <coughs> So we have time for one or two questions. <coughs> Eddie. In the beginning, you gave us an example of your strain self amplification with a sine function for 2000 L. So yes. I wonder if you're if you can, you can, you can build a method as uh, an expected anti diffusion and you can affect that, that the layering of, uh, of the system. I think in this case not, because um, you wouldn't have the organization of larger scale structures. Yeah. So this would be a, this is a process that goes to to, to smaller scales. So you would have you, you don't have an emerging length scale in this. <clears throat> Comment on the question. Yes. So comment is that the, so if we consider a homogeneous, large scale inhomogeneous situation, yeah. so most difficult part is how to evaluate this type of current crisis. Yes. So in this sense, your work is very, I think, suggestive and informative for current modeling, MHD. Yeah. So that one co comment. Okay. My question is that uh, so if you suggested to, to that, Coexistence of J 
uh, J and Sigma, mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, electric mm -hmm. current part and the strain part of yes. magnetic field. So yes. uh, what I just wonder <laughs> why, physical reason why you need uh, such a coexistence of J and uh, Sigma for get some uh, for the flux. Relevant okay. Flux. I yeah. can I can probably answer this in a slightly roundabout way. I'm not sure if we have enough time because um, uh, <coughs> so it essentially is the only way in which you can transfer. And I go back to this and this this will I mean this is really it this becomes a discussion <laughs> among experts, I think, but uh, um, what I'm saying assumes that there's no cross elicity. <laughs> okay, so if you have this term here, then um, then if you don't have any cross elicity, if you take the curl, you get you get a JJ, yeah, and uh, and if I have no cross elicity, they are orthogonal. Uh, sorry, no magnetic elicity, they are orthogonal in approximation, and that would tell me that in terms of In terms of this type, wouldn't occur because I need I need to, I need uh, uh, an alignment between the between the current and the strain rate eigenvectors. If I have an alignment between the magnetic field and the strain rate eigenvectors, which I have to have because otherwise I'm not maintaining the magnetic field, then that term is not going to be of, of big importance. No. Okay, yeah. so, thank you for asking. Yeah. Yeah. Specific question. Yes. Yeah. So let's thank our speaker again.